<laughs> awesome. Well, this is really exciting. We are doing another interview for our It's Complicated series this couple of months. My name is Emily. If you haven't had a chance to check out some of our other interviews, you can go ahead and follow various links that are probably going to be linked somewhere on our website. Today, I'm meeting with Shauna Collat. She is in Korean... Korean adoptee who grew up in Minnesota suburbs and is now living in New York City, which I think is awesome because I also got to live a little bit in New York City. So it's kind of a fun connection there. And we're really excited to just talk about her experience being an adopted daughter in the US with parents who don't share the same cultural backgrounds. So can you introduce yourself, Strata? Yes, thank you so much for having me. This is exciting. Um, so as Emily said, I'm Shauna Klatt, and I was adopted from Korea, from South Korea, when I was eight months old. So um, I came over as a baby and um, grew up in the suburbs of Minnesota. One thing that I will note is there are so many adoptees in Minnesota, so it wasn't unusual. Um, Minnesota had, and I think probably in the 70s and 80s, the highest number of adoptees from Korea. And a lot of it had to do with the connection with the um, social services. So anyways, I grew up there. Um, I also have a sister who's adopted and she's older than me, but she was adopted after me. Um, and then two brothers who are biological to my parents who are white. Um, let's see, I, so I grew up there and then uh, moved down to Albuquerque, New Mexico actually. Um, when I was in my very early 20s, and I was there for about three years, and then came back to Minnesota, and then moved out to New York City about five years ago. So that's where I've been, and I absolutely love it here. That is awesome. That is so cool, just seeing all the different places that you've gotten to live, and how is the weather over there? It's Is it spring yet? Is it fake it spring? It is. <laughs> yes. Well, it's 57 degrees, and okay. um, I've seen some of the tulips popping up at Central Park. So nice. yes, I think spring is here. <laughs> and the Mr. Softy trucks. <laughs> yes, exactly. I always feel like- I remember whenever, well. <laughs> I was like, oh, so Mr. Softy is here. It is spring. <laughs> um, so I think it's really interesting that you mentioned there are many people in your community growing up that were also adoptees. Can you share a little bit more about some of those connections that you made or even some of the shared experiences or differences that you had even within your own family and with your friends? Sure. Um, so if anyone is familiar with Minnesota, I was, um, I grew up in a smaller suburb um, north of Minneapolis. Um, I was adopted, my sister was adopted, and actually my best friend, Suki, she was adopted too, and she just lived around the corner. Um, so it was kind of, that was my, I guess, uh, Korean world. <laughs> Um, there, outside of that, there really weren't um, uh, many Asians in the area. My, because my sister came um, when she was older, she was eight, um, a social worker would come to our house and she would help my mom learn how to cook. She would help translate, you know, for the language. And so we kind of grew up with the Korean culture around us. It, um, you know, my mom, my white mother would have jars of kimchi on the, on the kitchen counter, um, you know, and so it, it wasn't very, it wasn't unfamiliar, I should say. Um, and then me and my friend Suki, we would always play and, you know, we, we would have kind of some um, Korean culture integrated into our lives. Uh, in particular, during the summers, we would go to a Korean culture camp. And so, you know, we would wear a hanbok and we would learn the songs and the dances. And um, then our moms would also take us out. There wasn't really any um, much Korean restaurants there, many Korean restaurants, but they would take us out for, you know, Chinese food and, and as, as close to Korean as we could get. And I do remember my mother always took me to Kim's Oriental Market on Snelling Avenue in St. Paul. And um, so I was, I was, I mean, this is probably 1980. So I grew up going there to get all of the Korean ingredients. And then as an adult, I went there and, um, you know, my son, I would bring him there. So that has probably been the, the most, the long standing um, Korean, uh, I guess, memory, you know, or, or thing in my mind that I've always appreciated and um, 
I don't know if you've read the book Crying in H Mart, but I, it's on my list of books to read. I have okay. a long list of books to read, but I I saw it recently. It's wonderful. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I hope you read it, but it it kind of evoked a lot of emotion for me too, even though the author isn't um, adopted you know, just kind of having that connection through food or through grocery or whatever, um, that can be pretty powerful. Yeah, definitely. I've had the privilege and opportunity to kind of learn some recipes from family, friends, aunties, Mm -hmm. uncles. And I think that is something as a fourth generation Chinese American allows me to feel more connected to the people who came before me and I would probably consider myself pretty Americanized, but having those conversations of where people came from and how they learned the recipe Mm -hmm. um, has been really, really special. Mm -hmm. So as you kind of saw your experience as a child moving into young adulthood, you mentioned you moved to New Mexico. What kind of led to the next couple of moves and ultimately ending in New York City? Um, well, I moved down to Albuquerque. My son was very young. He was only four. And it was just kind of one of those things, you know, you're in, um, you're young and you want to explore the world or you want to try something new. And so there really wasn't anything specific that brought me to Albuquerque. Uh, my brother, actually, he lived there with his wife. Um, but I went down there and I, you know, we were there for maybe three years. The interesting thing about that, actually, Um, which I don't think about very often, but I know that, and I didn't realize this until later, but that it's uh, very um, strong in my son's, um, you know, memories of growing up and everything. Uh, There was a lot of racism against Asians down there. And it was something that I didn't um, know, I didn't anticipate, and I wasn't familiar with. Um, You know, being in Minnesota, there's Korean adoptees everywhere. Um, And people in Albuquerque were actually surprised that I was adopted by white parents. So that was something new for me. Um, Anyways, we eventually made our way back up to Minnesota. And then um, through my job, um, I'm a client manager and lawyer at a big corporation. I got a promotion and I moved to New York about five years ago. Wow, that is so cool. That's, it's such an interesting (laughs) thought. I just moving from different neighborhoods, even for something as simple and little as moving from Southern California to Northern California, I have not, I hadn't previously had that many Asian American friends because I grew Mm -hmm. up in a white dominated space in the suburbs in Southern California. So I, I, it wasn't normal for me to have this, just to even see folks on the street, like walking um, or like I have a Korean restaurant down the street and a Chinese bakery down the street, both run by their respective people. And it, it feels like aunties just run these, yeah. these restaurants. And it's wild because when I was growing up, we'd have to drive like 40 minutes to like, to an hour to like, go get mm-hmm. Chinese American food. And so now right. it's like a block down the street. And when my family comes to visit, they're like, oh, can we go there? Because because it's really good. And it's also really inexpensive. (laughs) And it's just, I think it's wild to like, think about that. And how do you feel that influenced how you saw yourself in your identity, whether that be as a Korean adoptee or a Korean American or an American, or just as a person in the world, how do you think that really if that impacted how you saw yourself? Yeah, I think all of it did. I think um, there's just been different events throughout my life that sometimes it's stronger and I connect, you know, very um, closely to the adoptee community. I'm part of um, an organization called Also Known As, and it's a group of adoptees. And it's it's familiar, you know, and it, it feels like home. Um, and then, um, you know, I'm a Korean American is how I identify myself. Um, I'm the, the, the co-lead of our Asian affinity network um, at, my, at my company. Um, and so what I do there is a lot of diversity, equity, and inclusion, but it's um, advocating on behalf of um, other AAPI employees. And especially now when that's so important, 
um, you know, with the rise in anti-Asian hate crimes, and especially out in New York City, a lot of the people are scared to go outside, including me, <laughs> um, you know, and to take the train and to go to work and all of that. So I feel connected to that community as well. You know, it doesn't matter that I'm a Korean adoptee, I'm a Korean American, I am an Asian woman, and I'm still part of that, that demographic. Um, so I feel like, I guess, all combined into one, <laughs> you know, I, I have my connection with the adoptee community, you know, and, and just being um, adopted, as well as just being an Asian American woman and, you know, advocating for my community. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. It's so inspiring listening to your story. As you Thanks. know, I'm also never getting that world. And it's, it's always so encouraging to see the pioneers who come before us and like before me. And so I really appreciate you sharing your experiences. And I think as we kind of just conclude, I would love to hear you mentioned a little bit in your in your written interview, but just from your own, you know, expression right now, as an Asian American woman in the world, what are some of the the biggest lessons that you've learned or something that you feel other AAPI women can can also use as wisdom? I would say um, be confident in who you are. Be confident that you're an Asian woman. You know, there's so many stereotypes that we encounter um, and that society has of us and, you know, the model minority and just you know, um, not many Asians proceed up the corporate ladder. Um, you know, they kind of get to a certain point, but aren't seen as managers, things like that. Um, you know, be confident in who you are and kind of break those stereotypes, break those molds. Um, don't feel like you're confined or that you have to be a certain way because that's how society sees you. Thank you. That's just mm -hmm. so encouraging, so inspiring. I really appreciate your time today. And your time providing us the interview and just thank you so much. <laughs> yes, you're welcome. Thank you so much for having me.